What could these sides possibly agree to in today's, in today's peace talks? And to get a deal, you actually need everyone to walk away feeling like they actually won something, that they actually achieved something through these talks. Ukraine, for example, Ukraine wants survival. It wants self-government. It wants a self-government free from Russian interference. On the other side, Russia wants de facto leadership of its backyard with no NATO influence. It wants Ukraine out of NATO forever. And then there's the United States, which wants a free and democratic Ukraine, but also doesn't seem to mind getting Russia's military bogged down in a deadly quagmire that weakens Russia and Vladimir Putin. And what about the growing accusations of war crimes against Russia, as well as some charges that have now been leveled against Ukrainian forces? Would peace still be peace if it didn't come with some sort of justice for the victims of indiscriminate attacks on the civilians who have died? Let's try to unpack all of this with Ivo Dalder, president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and the former U.S. ambassador to NATO, and Gabrielle Rifkin, director of the Oxford Process, a conflict resolution group. He is the co-author of The Fog of Peace, How to Prevent War. Uh, it's great to have, Gabrielle, it's great to have you both with us. Excuse me. Um, Eva, I'd like to start with you. L last week, you wrote in The Guardian that all indications suggested that Vladimir Putin might escalate the fighting in Ukraine uh, and NATO would actually have to respond to that. With all that's happened this week that we've just run through, ha have you changed at all your views on that? Do these up and down negotiations give you any encouragement whatsoever? Well, you know, it's always better to uh, jaw jaw than war war, as Winston Churchill uh, is believed to have said. Uh, so as long as there are conversations, uh, that is far uh, better than if there are no conversations. The communication lines need to be open. But I also think we need to be realistic that when it comes to uh, uh, Vladimir Putin in particular, uh, he's not looking for a negotiated way out. He's certainly not looking out for a way out that doesn't allow him to claim victory and remember what he is uh, uh, about and what he is trying to do. He wants to control the future of Ukraine. He's been trying to figure out a way to do that ever since uh, uh, really the colored revolution, the orange revolution in 2004, but certainly since he first invaded uh, Ukraine in 2014. He thought that a massive military operation would quickly topple uh, the government and allow him to put in a government more to his liking and more importantly, that he could control. He's been unable to do that uh, in week six, where he's still no closer to Kiev than he was in week one. Uh, the same is true in other parts of, uh, of Ukraine. And, and we are seeing him uh, potentially, as the NATO Secretary General said, uh, repositioning. I just don't see him negotiating anything that the Ukrainians can find acceptable. Ukraine, on the other hand, uh, is clearly indicating that it's willing to talk, but it also will continue to fight. It wants to restore the territorial integrity, the sovereignty and independence of its own country. It doesn't want Russian forces occupying its territory. And it certainly doesn't want to be left in a position in which it's faced uh, uh, Russia, even a post-war period, by itself. So it wants security guarantees from countries that so far have been unwilling to, uh, to grant it. So I'm afraid we're going to see a lot more fighting before this is over. Gabrielle, a few weeks before Russia invaded, you wrote in The Guardian that it was up to NATO not to escalate this crisis into a war. Uh, you write in part, quote, Putin is a very proud man and smart politics by Western governments should offer face-saving gestures if we are serious about avoiding war. We know obviously that did not work because we are now entering week six of that war. Ukraine, though, for its part, has offered some of those face-saving measures like I was just outlining, including neutrality and possibly even talking about Russian claims to various parts of its country, not necessarily agreeing to, but at least willing to talk about it. What should happen next in your view? Well, the peace talks are very important um, and are continuing. And I think a lot of work is going on quietly behind the scenes. So we have the public face of the peace talks and then we have um, them sitting together day by day trying to work out the detail. What, what really matters on this is everybody needs to be able to sell the peace deal to their people. And this is very difficult because when one side is the aggressor, um, 
it can look like an act of appeasement even to think about what is Putin going to sell to his people. And unfortunately, the way it's been uh, presented to the Russians is um, they are going to be, at this point, perhaps unrealistic on what they're prepared to accept. And I don't disagree that there won't be some kind of escalation in the war, but I think we should take the peace talk seriously. Evo, Russia's uh, shift, uh, it seems, just by reading the battlefield, its shift to focus from Kyiv to Donbass has led some experts to think that maybe Putin wants to take eastern Ukraine, carve it out, maybe use it as a bargaining chip, hoping that he can make Ukraine accept Russian annexation of the Donbass territories. As I mentioned, um, no indication that Ukraine would ever accept that, but they said at least to stop the fighting, they're willing to talk about these claims. Do you see a scenario where Kyiv might accept that as unjust as it may actually sound to you and me? Uh, not today, uh, although I'm sure they're willing to talk about it. And the question is, what else uh, needs to be in an agreement? Uh, you know, they've uh, apparently put on the table, for example, an arrangement with regard to the Crimea uh, that would uh, kind of like Hong Kong lease back uh, uh, to Russia for a limited period of time, whether it's 15 years or, 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 or more, uh, that part that uh, Russia has already annexed and say, uh, it's still Ukrainian sovereignty, but we understand you will control it for some period of time. So there, there, there are formulas that uh, can be uh, agreed to. Uh, clearly, whatever the Ukrainians can accept is something that I think we all need to accept. Uh, importantly, Ukraine has made clear that whatever is agreed needs to be subject to a referendum. It has to be sold to the people directly. Um, so it's, it, it can't just be giving in to whatever the Russians want. And then importantly is this issue of security guarantees. I, I think this is uh, going to be a, a big issue uh, going forward. What the Ukrainians have said is that they're happy to settle for neutrality. Uh, they understand that getting uh, into NATO is not only a problem for the Russians, but frankly, it's a problem for NATO, which is one of the reasons they haven't been allowed in, um, even though they have wanted to. Uh, uh, but they want security guarantees, and, and one can understand why. They have been fighting a war now for uh, not just six weeks, but eight years uh, against the Russians. They've lost uh, a large number of people in those eight years, and of course, in the last six uh, uh, weeks, extraordinary damage to the Ukrainians. A quarter of the population displaced, uh, one-tenth of the population uh, made refugee. Uh, and, and under those circumstances, they want to make sure if there's a peace, it's, it lasts, and they need security guarantees. And that's going to be a very tough sell for the Russians. Are the United States and, and Poland and the UK and France and Canada and Germany all going to be prepared to provide real binding security guarantees to, uh, uh, to Ukraine that if it gets attacked, uh, they will come to its defense? And frankly, are the Russians going to accept this? Uh, I think that's where uh, a big stumbling block, a block is going to come, quite apart from what territory may or may not uh, end up in whose hands at the end of this war. Gabrielle, assuming that there is a, a situation in which the, the fighting stops, the war actually stops, regardless of what that peace looks like, there is this growing mountain of evidence that Russia has targeted civilians, has relied on indiscriminate attacks, has committed a lot of alleged war crimes. How do you negotiate peace with suspected war criminals? And then how do you ultimately get victims of the violence to accept some kind of settlement that does not bring accountability and justice to those who have suffered? Yeah, it's an incredibly difficult question. And, you know, of course, people are entitled to justice. And if there have been war crimes, then that's what people want. But I think what you have to, to recognize at this point, that the greatest human rights abuse is war. And therefore, every little ounce of energy needs to go into stopping this war and and the degree of suffering that's happening. So my take is the International Criminal Court is not at this point, should not be priority. What needs to happen is what happens around the negotiating table. And anything that will get in the way of that process or extend it, so for example, you know, talks about uh, the International Criminal Court um, must be delayed to trying to find enough common ground.
Ivo, do you agree with that? I mean, should, should Russia be forced to pay for some damage it has done in Ukraine? I mean, beyond the killing, there are major cities like Mariupol uh, that have been rendered uninhabitable. Human infrastructure has been destroyed and set back decades. Should reparations or rebuilding be part of these negotiations right now? I think finding a way out uh, of the war that is lasting, uh, I think, is the most important. I, I think, and it has to be lasting. A ceasefire that that breaks down immediately uh, has no has no value. The question of reparations and the question of who pays for the reconstruction, I think, is an important one. Uh, and we, we we have a number of historical lessons here. Uh, of course, after World War One, uh, the Allied powers imposed that cost directly on Germany, uh, which led to uh, a degree of resentment that ultimately. Uh, brought to power uh, a, uh, the, the Nazis and, and, and Adolf Hitler and led to World War II. So we have to be careful about how much punitive uh, uh, retaliation one has afterwards. And at the same time, uh, one also has to be prepared to, uh, to make sure that what has happened to this country is reversed, that it gets rebuilt stronger and more capable uh, and for more people uh, than, than, than ever before. Uh, I think Russia may have to be part of that solution, but frankly, so uh, should uh, and will the United States and the European allies. Uh, it is in our interest that Ukraine emerge from this as a strong, vibrant, prosperous and democratic society, something that, of course, the Marshall Plan after World War II helped to do for much of Europe. Um, so there is a balance here between how uh, punitive one wants to be on the one hand and how much one wants to make, make sure that uh, the country is restored to its former glory and, in fact, perhaps even stronger comes out of it, uh, uh, notwithstanding all the incredible brutality that it already has seen in the past few weeks. Um, Eva, let me ask you about what you think the U.S. role in all of this should be. I mean, obviously, the U.S. has organized major sanctions against Russia. What would it take for the U.S. to lift those sanctions? Um, is it simply a cessation of hostilities? I mean, will the U.S. have its own separate demands other than Ukraine to lift those sanctions? Because sometimes it seems like we want an immediate end to the fighting and we want to preserve a free and democratic Ukraine. Other times it seems the U.S., uh, is content on bleeding out the Russian military for a, f a little bit longer in Ukraine to weaken it out and perhaps, uh, as the president has said, not directly, but at least calling for regime change and putting Vladimir Putin under a tremendous amount of domestic pressure in Russia. Well, I think uh, the, what the U.S. has said, and uh, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, has said that uh, it will, the sanctions, we can't even start talking about lifting sanctions until Russian forces have completely withdrawn in an irreversible manner uh, from all of Ukraine. And so I think that is the minimum. Uh, it is also something that the British Foreign Secretary uh, uh, has underscored yesterday, that the complete withdrawal of all Russian forces from all of the territory of Ukraine is necessary precondition for starting to talk about uh, about the end of sanctions. I do think personally, uh, and I agree in that sense with some of the sentiment that one hears uh, coming out of the White House, um, that as long as uh, Russia is capable of inflicting the kind of damage it is, it is inflicted, we need to think about how we constrain Russia, how we contain it, how we uh, pressure it not to uh, resume uh, the kind of fighting that it has engaged in. Uh, and sanctions could be uh, very well a part of that. Um, uh, after all, uh, we didn't have economic relationship with the Soviet Union during uh, 40 years of containment, uh, which did, uh, in the end, help uh, lead to a change in, in, the, uh, in the regime there, not brought out by, uh, by external intervention, but th through internal political, political change. Uh, something like that ultimately is uh, is likely necessary when it comes to Putin uh, and the regime that he represents. Not an outside interference in regime change, as I think President Biden made clear in explaining his his sentiments earlier uh, earlier uh, last week or this week. Uh, but clearly uh, maintaining the pressure uh, uh, for uh, Russia to right. change. What Russia did in the last six weeks is is really remarkable and we can't live in a situation uh, where this re recurs. 
Uh, Gabrielle, final thought to you. I mean, are the sanctions working? Because if you just look at some of the very basic indicators, the Russian uh, ruble seems to recover at least 80 percent, I believe, or so of its value. Uh, at the same time, you have Putin, who is threatening to cut off Europe from Russian oil and gas unless they pay in rubles. And the sanctions were supposed to be some kind of, you know, punishment against stopping Russia from this war. It hasn't. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd like to answer that question slightly differently. Maybe the impact will be more long term. But I think you have to look at, do you want sanctions to be punishment or a deterrent? And if you want to bring mm. about the end of the war, how to use sanctions as some kind of incentive? I think the danger is, and I think the U.S. has quite a long tradition of this, is they've kept permanent sanctions with Iran, Venezuela, Cuba, and actually it leads to permanently very hostile relationships and not a change of behavior. I think what we have to think is post this about, in the end, we're going to have to work out how countries coexist. So I think the U.S. would, would be wise to right. seriously consider using sanctions as some kind of incentive with the offer that in some way they will be lifted if there's a peace agreement. So, All right, Gabrielle Rifkin, uh, Evo Dalder, it's great to have both of you with us. Thank you so much for your insights and starting us off this evening.